So if you are reviewing your material and you get stuck, uh, don't be bashful, let me know. Uh, shoot me an email, Again, I'm not going anywhere. Um, here. Don't, don't put off studying is my message because after Thanksgiving, we will have one class left on IRD, Income with Respect to Deceiving, Code Section 691, which comes up also fairly regularly in the trust and state practice. And then we will have our final exam, which uh, will be cumulative. It will cover material that's, that we covered in the first half of the semester, but it will largely be items that we cover in the second half. But, but again, um, there will be items certainly that we covered in the first half. Any questions, substantively or logistically? All good? And again, the um, final exam will probably be pretty similar in format, true, false, multiple choice, short essay kind of answers. Right? So look for more of the same. Just look a few more questions because, again, the final exam will be more heavily weighted than, than the midterm exam. Let me just also, since I would assume some of you know we had a, an election in this country. Um, so uh, in, case, in case you missed it, we did. Um, and I can say this, um, that I would say that there's, for the first time I can say, I think that there's a 60, 65% chance, 70% chance that there is not going to be in a state Indian tax law in, in my next year because that is top on the Republican platform. And I'm not quite sure what's going to stop anyone from instituting a uh, complete repeal for the estate tax. Now, the good news for your team is that I do not think your Wednesday nights were well spent here, uh, because even if the uh, estate and gift tax laws were repealed, everything in my opinion about subchapter J would largely remain intact. And even if Donald Trump and the Republican Congress and Senate were to um, reduce the number of tax brackets, uh, that's going to change code section 1A. I do not hear anything about vast reforms when it comes to subchapter J. That was not on the Republican platform. So um, my message is uh, yes, maybe the tax rates would change, but little else, in my opinion, will change regarding the material you covered this semester. So uh, for some of you, maybe all of you, maybe. Who knows, none of you. Uh, there is a silver lining in, in, in the uh, upcoming Trump administration. Um, so, again, in, in case you were worried. So, if you hear people talking about the repeal of the state and gift tax laws, what I do envision, this is again me uh, trying to be clairvoyant, which I'm anything but, but I would think that a lot of fairly wealthy people, not so wealthy people, will start setting up trusts in getting their wealth put into trust. Why? Just in case the Democrats are elected to reinstitute the state gift tax. So that you could see people pro prophylactically stuffing wealth into trust vehicles um, and get it, getting it off the table for years or millennium to come. Because they can put it in trust and because there's no GST tax, um, that uh, you could see that happen. And if you're curious, I'm working on two projects that you may or may not find interesting, okay? Project number one, uh, many of you know that in 1976, and then again in the year 2010, what did our country have in place? It was in, it, what, what was instituted in 1976? That was suspended in 1978 and then retroactively repealed in 1980? So it never came into being. It was a carryover basis rule. Okay, so that in, in lieu of Code Section 1014, Congress did not have uh, wanted a carryover basis rule. But it was so complex, it was a, what they call a fresh start adjustment so that people would get a basis equal to fair market value at, in 1976, at that date, the effective date, and there was all sorts of wacky adjustments. So it was deemed too complex, retroactively repealed. And then, in the year 2010, if you recall, there was a one-year suspension of the estate tax. And we had a carrier basis rule, but it really never came into full fruition. So, um, 
what I've been writing, and I think this has some promise, but so you heard it here first. Uh, we'll see if it, if, if it gets any traction. Um, I'm writing this new paper that I'm hoping will be done in a few weeks, so if you want a, a, a preliminary copy, I'd be happy to share with you. Why not have a carrier? The biggest gripe about a carrier over basis, guys, is that most people don't know what the basis they have in their own assets. How are they going to know about the basis someone has in their decedent's assets, right? I would agree that's the big complaint. Why don't we limit carryover basis rule to marketable securities? Because beginning of the year 2011, marketable securities, for the first time, tax basis had to be re reported, right? There was a new code section. Uh, 6045G that requires brokerage firms. So, and let's face it, there's a lot of wealth tied up in market securities. A lot of, uh, like the mainstay. Admittedly, there's wealth tied up in real estate and things like that, and in personal residences. But let's face it, Congress is never going to tax people on Aunt Millie's house, right? When Aunt, Aunt Millie dies and leaves the house, Congress is never going to get to that thing. Everyone agree? So why not take what we can get? And I start the paper off with a quote uh, that I sort of like this quote, not on my own. Uh, I think it's committed to Voltaire. Don't let perfect be the uh, what is it? Don't let perfect be the en enemy of good. Okay? Think about this. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Is this the perfect solution? No. It's not a bad one, right? So anyway, that's paper one, almost done. Paper two, that we're working on. I do think that even if the uh, Trump administration wants to do with the estate tax, at some point or fashion, and this dovetails what we spoke about in chapter four about the grand for trust rules, if, if the um, government does not maintain some form of, of a gift tax, what will taxpayers do left, right, and in between in our practices? Shift assets. Shift assets to whom? Kids. Kids and younger, right? Yes. You could suppose grandma and grandpa, they're living on Social Security, right? Shift the assets to grandma and grandpa, have them sell the securities and get them back. You know, assuming it's not a, a complete sham where you gift it one day, they sell it the next, and they gift it back the day after. I don't know what the government can do with it. Certainly the IRS doesn't have the resources to police all those transactions. So um, I had the preliminary stages of the paper about why we have to maintain the gift tax. So anyway, uh, I think it's all related somewhat to the course and some of the material that we covered. All right, in terms of material you need tonight, let's just make sure, and I brought behind Anthony, you should see, just in case, I brought sample questions and answers to tonight, charitable trust. Okay, we're gonna have that. There should be a chapter for reading material for tonight. Everyone have that? I have a handout on charitable remainder annuity trust with numerical computation. Everyone should have that. And I just handed out, and I have more of these. Uh, Rashid, I, I left at your desk um, two revenue procedures. And now I did not know, and I think I may have, you, they may be at your desk too. Procedure. You got the two revenue, and he said, do you have it? Two revenue procedures. Revenue procedure 2003 and 54. You may not be so happy. So. Hey, Tal, you got it? Yeah. All right. So everyone has all these reading. Anthony, do you have that? You may not. Just make sure you have the reading material, not for next week, because next week we won't be here. But the week after, you have. Um, three things, which is the questions, the answers, and a chapter on IRD. Okay? So you should have three things for next week as well. 
not next week, the week after, or next class. And let me just do this. CJ. CJ, what is this? This is the last one. This is the last one. Is that an extra copy? Do you need one? Yeah. Oh, it's up there. section 664B, you'll see that there's a tiered payment arrangement, tiered payment arrangement. The first, this is um, tax by pain, let's put it this way. Uh, first ordinary income, then capital gains, then tax exempt income, then principal, okay? So whatever causes the taxpayer the greatest tax burden, is how this tiered arrangement is designed. And we're going to see that 664B. One, two, three, and four. Notice 664C. It says the general remainder annuity trust and remainder trust shall not be subject to any income tax. Okay, so the trust itself endures no tax. There are certain excise taxes that can apply. And 664D is important. Why is it important? It gives you the framework for what these trusts are going to look like. And it gives you with specificity the parameters. to not be less than 5% in terms of the annuity payment, or more than 50%, can last longer than 20 years or for life or lives of individuals. 
That's under D1A. For these are all, D1 deals with annuity trust, D2 deals with unit trust. So D1 sets certain perimeters. Capital letter B says these can be the only payments. Capital letter C says it must be charitable in nature. And capital letter D says the remainder interest has to be at least 10% of the initial fair market value. And 664D2. is sort of the same lay of the land, guys. Almost parrots. Except the big difference, notice, let's go back to D1. D1A says a sum certain. When we talk about an annuity, guys, everyone knows, or their clients know, or think of an annuity as a fixed sum. Doesn't, no variation, right? In contrast, D2, uni, deals with a fixed percentage, fixed percentage. That's the big difference between D1 and D2. If you look at D3, 664 D3. There are instances when you can pay the lesser of the unit trust amount or income. You can pay the lesser of the two. Okay, we just go over here. So statute, let me also make a few more observations to and, and just share from practical experience, guys. In my career, I have set up several charitable remainder trusts. Not so many charitable lead trusts, and we'll see why as we as the night unfolds. But have any of you dealt with either setting up or preparing returns or anything to do with charitable trusts? Anthony, yeah, tell, us, tell us your experiences. I'm just familiar with one. I haven't set one up or not a retirement one, but really my understanding of it is you place the asset in this trust, you get income from it, and then the remainder goes. Stop, stop, stop. <coughs> First, you never get the income from it. You get either fixed dollar amount or fixed percentage, right? Yeah, that's Just stuff. be careful of your terms. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and then anything else you picked up from it? Yeah, assets that are lost in the trust and you pass money go to the charity or a portion of the assets. So it all goes to charity? The whole thing. Okay. And that's after a term of years or for someone's life. Adrian, you're going to say? Right. Um, you know, and let me just ask you again, 30,000 feet up. Why do people set these up? You get a charitable deduction. You get a charitable deduction, which we'll go through. You get a check. If you put in a million dollars, you get a deduction for a million? No, it's the present that whole. It's the what? Isn't it the like, present value? Or the, the present value, the remainder, which yeah. is what we're talking about. So you get, but why do people set it up, aside from the charitable deduction? State my And what's the virtue of this? It's out of your state. It's outside your state. Truth be told, it actually is includable in your state. 
because you're getting an income stream, but then you get a charitable deduction upon your demise. So if you had clients, why might you set these up, guys? What kind of clients would look to set this up? Business owner. And why would a business owner? Maybe sell your, technically sell your interest in the business, not the trust. So. You gotta be careful of setting something called self-dealing if there's <laughs> excise taxes if you're selling it to a trust. I mean, here are people, let me just, look, what are people's options if they're charitably inclined? They can give the money outright, right, to the American Red Cross, agreed? Get a charitable deduction dollar for dollar. Or, these would be kind of a remainder trust, what they can do is get an upfront charitable deduction, not dollar for dollar, just the remainder interest, but then have an annuity flow to themselves. A lot of people like this notion for the rest of their lives, they're gonna get X dollars every year, year in, year out, right? And feel good that they've also made that simultaneous contribution. So it's a way to sort of give them a cash flow, uh, get a charitable deduction, um, and ensure you know, their favorite charity. I tell people, you know, don't be lulled into thinking that you can create these trusts in a manner that, because of tax benefits, that you're going to end up with more money in your pocket than when you started. So, what I remind people that you only want to set these up if you are charitably inclined, right? You don't want to set these up with the expectation that, gee, I can put a million dollars into a charitable or remainder trust, and then I'll end up with 1.2 million when, when you take into account all the actuarial numbers. Probably not going to happen. I mean, sometimes you can fool the, the actuarial tables, meaning um, you get a, let's say the charitable remainder is, let's just say hypothetically, is worth 40%, right? Because of your age, you set up a lifetime charitable trust, and let's just suppose you're 50 years old, and actuarially, uh, your lifespan now is 30 years, right? And you set up the trust, and based on that, you get a deduction, say, of, um, 400,000, like the, you put in a million, you get an actual deduction of 400,000. And good news to you, for you, is still living to age 80, you live to age 90, right? What does that mean? Did you get too small or too large of a charitable deduction? Guys? Too large. Too large, right? In retrospect, the charity had to wait an extra 10 years, that means actually, it should have, you should have been entitled to a much smaller child reduction, right? So you won. Conversely, if you set up a trust and the next day you die, um, you could have gotten a much larger child reduction, right? If you'd just given the money outright, and now you only have a million dollars, only got a $400,000 child reduction. Agreed? So you can win and lose with these, right? But I, I tell clients, look, don't go in with the expectation that you're gonna end up with, again, more money, and I think you should be safe with this with your clients and say the same thing. Questions about it, 30,000 feet up? So, the authors of this casebook, not our casebook, the book that, this is a new edition of federal Income Taxation and Trust in the States that just came out, so I thought it would be good to look at the newest edition. Um, it talked about why in 1969 charitable trusts had to be revised. Why, why did Congress overhaul this area of the law? And it was simple. It used to be that you could set up a split interest trust where any, you could get income for a term of years, or um, you could get income for a term of years or for someone's life, and then it would go to charity, okay? Everyone got that, that you get an income, not an annuity amount, not a unit of trust amount, which is a fixed percentage, but income. And what would taxpayers do? And remember, you could be your own trustee with these, okay? There's no issues of uh, grant for trust rules or whatnot. So 
picture if you could, you're the trustee, and it's a child of a remainder trust, right? What might you do in terms of getting income in and out of that trust and manipulating the system? What might you do as trustee? What are, and when I say what might you do, what did people do? It it used to, go ahead. It used to take a lot out of the trust. They would take a ton out of the trust, right? They would have high, high yielding junk bonds or whatever, because to say the income interest could be extraordinarily large, and the charity could end up uh, with the term uh, buckets, right? And um, that was not going to bode well for the charities. And in 1969, they said, look, there's just too much flexibility with these instruments. Uh, we can't do this, right? We can't do this. So 1969, then President Kennedy said, let's say, if you want a child reduction, the only thing that we're going to permit in this context are these two forms of trust. Just make sure you have all of these other things, too. All right. So when people talk about charitable trust and they don't fit into these four quadrants, they don't qualify at all, period. Okay? You don't have any flexibility here. All right, so what the authors do, beginning um, in section 11.02, it's entitled Charitable Remainder Trust. Definitions are important here. We're going to define what is the salient points of each. Beginning on the second line, let's go through each. A crack is a trust which the trustee must pay a fixed amount at least annually. So there's a few requirements there. Fixed amount annually to one or more persons for a term of years not greater than 20, or for the life or lives or the, of the annuitants. Notice the fair market value of the charitable remainder trust must be at least 10% of the initial fair market value of the trust property. So the, the charitable remainder must be at least 10% actuarial actually of the initial fair market value. And it says a crop. Okay, now we're, we're moving from a fixed annuity amount to a percentage amount. A fixed percentage. That percentage does not vary. Now notice in footnote 6, I want to call something to your attention. I call it to your attention in the statute, but it's worthwhile calling to your attention in footnote 6. It says, and it's citing to code section 6664D3, capital letter B, which I call to your attention, it says, with respect to a trust, the governing instrument, this is four or five lines down, they also include a makeup provision that requires payout in subsequent years of any trust income in excess of the unit trust amount to the extent necessary to make up for prior year shortfalls occasioned by the income only limitation. So suppose you set up a charitable remainder unit trust that said that it could pay the lesser of the unit trust amount or income. But there was a so-called makeup provision that said you could always pay out in years in which income exceeded the unit trust amount, you could pay out that excess. So let me give you a quick example just over two years and if I'm losing people. Suppose you set up a charitable remainder unit trust that pays out 6%, okay? And you put in a million dollars. So you put in a million dollars. This is not going to be good fit. Yeah, 
And that's the worst one I had to put one for here. I put in a million dollars, 6% uni trust amount, okay? And there's $50,000 year one. The trust earns 5% return of $50,000. Normally, how much must this uni trust pay out, guys? If it's plain vanilla. 60,000. Everybody agree? It's got to pay out a fixed percentage. It's, it, it's uh, agnostic about what kind of return the trust has, right? It pays out 6%. The next year, the trust would have 990,000, uh, and they would have to pay out 6% of that lower figure, right? But this says pay out the lesser of 6% or the income, right? So what, what gets paid out to the beneficiary in year one? 50, right? Year two, suppose the trust earns income of 75,000. How much can it pay out? How much? 60. But it has a makeup provision. Plus so so it, it, it pays out the lesser of the unit trust amount, which is six, or the income, so it's 6%, which is 60,000, right? <coughs> Plus it has a makeup provision, which says it, remember this year there's a $10,000 shortfall, right? So it can pay up to 70,000 in year two. I'm going to see if you guys are awake or not. Who the hell would set up a trust like this? Because when, <clears throat> when you're doing the actuarial computation to figure out your charitable deduction, do you take into account the, the provision that says pay out the lesser? Or does it just assume that you're going to pay out this, right? the 6%, and if the trust continues, guys, right? Suppose that you have 6% and every year the trust only gets <clears throat> a 5% return, okay? Everyone have the visual. You have a 6% annuity amount, trust only pays out 5%, so you're gonna just get $50,000 each year. Would you have been better or worse if you had put down from, from a charitable deduction? What would yield a higher charitable deduction? A 6% or 5% here? Five. Five, right? If you use five, right? Because 5% means that you've retained less, right? Right? The charity would get more, the, the, the less you retain, the bigger the charitable deduction, right? If the unit trust now was 15%, right? Does the charity, and the term of the trust was 20 years, does the charity have something robust to look for, forward to? Probably not, right? If you're taking out a 15% unit trust amount, chances are there isn't gonna to be too much left in that trust. Everyone agree? In contrast, if you take out 5%, you know, I, I can't promise in this low interest rate environment what's gonna be left, but probably a pretty good, good amount, right, Patrick? So, getting back to my issue, in hindsight, no offense, you were pretty stupid, right, to have this provision, pay out the lesser of the two, agree? Yeah. Because, and, you, and again, I come back to my question, who the hell would do this? So, but there's people who would, who would might do this? Because on the face of it, right, it's non nonsensical, right? Does AMT limit charitable contributions? Say again? Does AMT limit charitable contributions? Someone does it? Does AMT limit charitable contributions? AMT limits charitable Well, it does, but when you limit it in any, it might limit it. Okay. All right, here's, here's what the psychology is. 
for people who sit up. And this again is explained in footnote six that you could have a so-called makeup provision. When might you want a makeup provision to come into being, guys? When might you want a makeup provision? If true, say again. In the future, we have less income. Yes, and who might you define as people having less income? Old people. Retired people. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's not call them old. We're going to be your clients one day. And the notion is, look, if you're a corporate CEO and you don't need money right now, okay, I know for some of us in this room that may be hard to fathom. You don't need money. That seems like a contradiction in terms. But let's suppose that you're a guy who's pulling in 40, 50 million a year, right? And you max out in your retirement accounts. You can't, you can't possibly put any anything more in your uh, defined contribution plan, defined benefit plan. You, you're at all the maxes. Might you consider, hey, I'll set this up, right? It will have um, <coughs> low income because the nature will, will invest in high growth in the early years, which will pay very little income, and we'll have these tremendous makeup provisions. And in later years. When my income dips because I'm now retired, we'll trigger the makeup provisions, hopefully, and we'll invest in high yield securities or whatever bonds. And in that context, we'll have tremendous returns, you know, and we can pay out the larger amount. So do you see the psychology? That's what's going on here. So if you looked at this before and you said to yourself, yeah, it's in the code, but no one would ever use it. I've set up my share of NIMPRUX before, okay? <coughs> Have they worked? I don't know. I mean, the question is, I, I don't know if the people, I, once I set them up, the people, the trustees take over, it's, on, it's out of my, I don't do the returns, so it's, I don't know the success or value. No one's told me to complain, let's put it that <laughs> That's never a bad sign. All right? <coughs> I mean, you do have to point out to clients, there's no, I mean, you, you know, if they only get a 5% return, it was stupid for them to have done this. And they have to feel comfortable at some point that they'll be able to flip it and command much higher returns. All right. So the authors in that footnote talk about that provision of NIMCRUTS. Now, we were just talking about CRUTS, and on the next page, remember, each year, the unit trust is a fixed percentage of the trust assets valued annually to one or more persons for a term of years not greater than 20 of the life, life or lives of individual beneficiaries. So what I have circled in red to my version is value annually. Okay? Why do I have that circled in red? Who do you want to caution? about setting up crops. By the way, you will be the hit of this weekend's uh, Thanksgiving and barbecue and all that stuff because you have picked up four new acronyms <laughs> that uh, people are going to marvel at just how, how well educated you are. All right, so, um, so that, what, what don't, who don't you want to be? I'll give you one person's name who shouldn't be setting up a crop. And last I checked, some people might think he has a four-letter name, but he truly has a five-letter name. Trump. Trump. Why might Trump not set up? Would he not approve him probably to set up a crop? don't want real estate, right? Which is hard to value asset or any hard to value asset. And a crop because every year you really should have an appraisal done, right? You have six percent of a building that fluctuates in value, right? It's very hard. Now if you put cash or securities, everyone knows what the value is. You know what six percent of. That's not true. You could put a building in you know, that generates rental income into a cra crap, right? <coughs> because we know it's a fixed amount. It doesn't matter what the building is worth year to year. Agreed? So just be forewarned, 
before I'm, I'm forewarning you with your clients, do not, or, or at least warn your clients, that their go-to instrument is not a crack, a, 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 excuse me, a crut with respect to hard-to-value assets. Agree? And, go ahead, Bill. Uh, uh, just had a question about this 10% rule. Is that correct? It says 10% of the fair market value of each contribution of trust property. Does that mean on the day it was contributed or? The day it was contributed. Okay. Also keep in mind, and this is, again, always have contrast, right, be in, between the annuity and uni trust. Annuity trust, a, a crap. Once it's established, no further contributions can be made, period. Anyone hear any ambiguity in my voice? Once it's established, no further contributions. In contrast, with a crop, if you want to make additional contributions, you can. Okay? Very important distinction between the two. Crat is CRAT, CRUT is CRUT, CRUT can have additional contributions, but CRAT cannot. <clears throat> I want to call your attention to footnote 14 and 15. Footnote 14 and 15 point out that the IRS, go ahead. Oh, the chat out right there. Oh. This is the um, chapter, the reading material. And there's an extra one or two up there. Okay. And, and Muhammad, if you don't have it, there should be an extra copy up there. But hopefully you have it. Right there? No. People may have taken the last one. You remind me after class if you don't mind. Um, footnotes 14 and 15, guys. Um, point out that when it comes to drafting these, and you guys may not be charged as the accountants to draft these, but be careful of attorneys who say, oh, don't worry, I came up with some unique language. Because the IRS has drafted models for virtually all of these forms of trust. Okay? So notice in footnote 14, there's two broad categories, and footnote 15, okay? Footnote 14 defines all the prototypes for crats, and footnote 15 defines all the prototypes for cruts. Everyone see that? And remember, these trusts can be formed during life, inter vivos, during life, or upon death, testamentary. And so they, the, they, they set forth the testamentary nature, um, table for one or more lives. Um, they go through all this, virtually any form of that you want is available. And again, in both flavors, craft flavor or crud flavor. Now what I did, just to give you a glimpse of this world, I took what I think are the two easiest. <coughs> if you look at Revenue Procedure 2003-54, and you look beginning on page 4 of 16, it 
it begins with the very simple provisions of a trap. Talks about how the trust is funded. What's critical here is the payment of the annuity amount. Notice item five, no additional contributions can be made to the trust. And it's very short, two pages. And you can go through this, but I just want to highlight those two pages. Just give me a quick overview. Nothing, no, nothing has to be too fancy here, guys. In fact, um, with clients, I would say, you guys stay strictly within these parameters. Do not get fancy. If you go to the other revenue procedure I handed out, 2005-53, let's get page four. It follows the same basic pattern. With the funding of the trust, payment of the unit trust amount, Look at item five. There's a whole long section about additional contributions. If you turn to page seven to 31, there's an item two on page seven to 31, valuation of unmarketable assets like real estate. If the trust is funded with unremarkable assets, then a fair market value of the assets must be determined exclusively by an independent trustee, or must be determined by a quote unquote qualified appraisal from a qualified appraiser. But that can be expensive if it's not easy to value assets. Can you get a chance, guys? I would just spend 15, 20 minutes with this. I think it's useful. Just go through and what a prototype looks like. Don't have to commit anything to memory, but I just thought um, you can see what people use to formulate these. Okay. <clears throat> On the next page of chapter 11 of this handout, it points out the normal subject through J rules do not apply to a crap and a crut. So, Step chapter J, I know you guys are a little bit um, frustrated that you can't use your knowledge base, but the good news is for your clients is that these trusts are exempt from income in their entirety, right? We already decided that. It's spelled out in the, in the code. Okay, so a charitable remainder annuity trust and annuity trust are exempt from income tax. Okay. The authors do point out on the following page relating to footnote 22, just so you can get your bearings. If in a given tax per year, a charitable remainder trust has what's called UBIT income, that's relating to charities that have unrelated business income, the trust is also subject to an excise tax equal to its UBIT income. So very, very rarely in really unusual circumstances will a charitable remainder trust be subject to tax. It's a rarity, but you should be on notice that it sometimes happens. Income taxation is a beneficiary of charitable trusts. All right, the next section, income taxation of the beneficiaries. We said, our beneficiaries tax for the charitable trust guys, does subject to J apply? No. no. We have our four tiered system spelled out on the next page. Four tiered system. Ordinary income, capital gain, other income, and principal. 
This is related to footnote 32. Sometimes what sometimes students miss, but not you guys. <coughs> if you go a few further lines, I just want to call your attention. It says, thus annuity or unit trust amounts are taxable entirely as ordinary income to the extent the trust has ordinary income for the year in question. And here's what students sometimes miss. Or accumulated ordinary income from prior taxable years. So it's not just this year's income, right? It includes accumulated income from prior years. And that goes for capital gain. It goes for other income too. So just make sure you don't look in this or look at this in a vacuum. Okay, guys? So it's like if we're in that scenario up there on the board, if they had 75000 but it only paid out to sixty the next year, there would be an extra $10,000 for your income to be taxed. Give me, give me my own example again. This year, if they I started with the 75 and they distributed sixty. We're going, so there's a big There's another 15000 15. 15. So 15, 15. That's 15. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So keep in mind, the taint remains. Okay, the taint remains. I want to call your attention to footnote 38.2. When I say I want to call your attention, look at the, in the text itself, next to 38.2. Within a given category, our distribution is deemed to consist first of a class of income that is subject to tax at the highest rate until that class is exhausted, and income that is subject to taxation at the next highest rate until that class is exhausted, and so on and so forth. So if you have dividend, dividend income and other ordinary income, what gets taxed first? That income which is subject to tax at the higher rate. Okay, so if you have multiple categories of the same, like um, unrecaptured 1250 capital gains or regular capital gains, whatever yield to the government the most revenue is the, if not a pro-taxpayer provision. Do not worry about allocation of deductions. That really doesn't come up in practice. And since trusts are generally in a calendar year, whatever is distributed is going to be subject to tax in the same calendar year as the tax pay. Distributions in kind, just be forewarned, your favorite case can come up. Well, one of your favorite cases. The Keenan case, K-E-N-A-N, so that if you have an annuity amount of 100000 that you have to pay out and you use appreciated assets, guess what? You're going to trigger a gain. And if you have a uni trust amount with a fixed dollar amount, guess what? It's going to trigger a gain. Gain to the, the trust. To the trust. But that's okay when, I mean, it's okay, it's going to trigger capital gain, which means when the distributions come out, it's going to be under the tier system. Oh, uh, okay. All right, everyone understand that? It's going to trigger gain to the trust, um, <clears throat> resulting in taxable income that ultimately will be distributed out to the beneficiaries. All right. <clears throat> Any questions on charitable remainder, annuity trust, or unit trust? Before we go on to the reading, I'd like to look at the other handout. Mohammed, do you have this one? Yes. Yeah. All right. So everyone want to pull out the one? Draw?
All right. Let me just walk you through this because I set up several of these trusts and look, there's other programs out there. I use number cruncher, okay? You can do the computations manually. And I say good luck to you. Um, there's lots of computer software companies out there that market their material that allow you to do these pretty straight. You enter a few different numbers and you can figure out the child of a remainder trot, if remainder interest, and things like that. So let me just, so with the first thing on the first page, it's dealing with the child of a remainder annuity trust. By the way, there's a 10% test that we talked about that's in bullet point two. Okay, everyone see that? The charity's interest at inception must be worth at least 10% of the value transferred to the trust. Everyone see bullet point two? And look at the last bullet point. The IRS has ruled that a trust is not a charitable or remain or annuity trust if there is a greater than 5% chance that the trust fund will be exhausted before the trust ends. That's a separate trust test. And this is where if the annuity payout percentage exceeds what's called the applicable federal rate for the month, there's a chance and if the chance is greater than 5% that the trust, uh, that the funds will be exhausted, uh, that the charity won't see a dime, it will not qualify as a charity or remainder trust, okay? And we'll see this in a moment. So anyway, the authors of this software, anytime you do a computation, they give you this one page sheet of make sure you have all these bullet points satisfied. If you turn the page, Notice this is a trust type for life. You transfer it in November. The applicable federal rate is still at a historic low, still about one point, it's a little bit higher now. You put in a million dollars. Let's suppose the trust grows at 6%. You pay out 5%. <clears throat> it's for one life for an age 80 year old, okay? If you're 80 years old, what's the, projected your projected lifespan about 7.8 years right what's the present value of the annuity 390,000 what's the remainder interest the balance so you would get approximately a six hundred to nine thousand dollar deduction everyone see that If you turn the page and you do, sorry, just to go back. A second. Yeah, go go back. Um, so it's that sixty point nine percent. That's what we need to be comparing to that ten percent rule, right? Yes. Okay. Now, if you turn two more pages, I guess my Xerox thing got a little screwed up here. If you look at the top, there's another chart. That has the same life. It's um, it's for age, again, the 80 year old, same thing. But look, it refers to revenue ruling 77-374. This deals with the 5% probability test. And here, there's a 49% probability that the charity is going to get, um, uh, going to get that the charity that the trust amount is not going to be exhausted by the end. Okay, there's a 49 percent probability that that this guy, whoever this person who set up this trust, isn't going to live to be say 120. And if this person did, this remember it's paying out an annuity amount equal to 60,000 when he's only generating $50,000 a year. So each year, um, it's dipping into principal, theoretically. So, but because the person's 80, chances are they're not gonna live long enough to exhaust the full principal. 
But if the person was two years old, not 80 years old, um, there could be a problem. All right? Anyway, um, on the third page, like, again, the Xerox has got a little screwed up here. But on the third page, you see the word trust type term at the very top? Trust type term. Is it child appropriate or new to trust? Trust type term. Everyone see that? At the very top? No, you got that? You got it? Is that what you got it? Yeah. Okay. So here, it's for a 10 year term, right? 10 year term is probably longer actuarially than this person may live. So here, the remainder interest, right, is going to be smaller, right? The charity has to wait longer because the term is, instead of being seven point something years, it's 10 years. So here, um, instead of the remainder interest being 609, it's 531. Why am I going through these illustrations with you guys? Just this is how this is done in practice. People, software, you put in the names, the ages, the applicable federal rate, and poof, out comes the remainder to still. I know it's not entirely relevant to us, but um, what are these numbers on here to tell you what the benefit, like the charitable benefit is for the individual? Is it a percentage of one of these? Is it, like, what would you use to figure out what my, if I was the beneficiary, what would I, how would I determine what my Well, what you could look at, I mean, if you keep turning the pages, there's this chart here. Mm -hmm. And depending, and again, you can play, like, Burr. one of the things you can play with is the growth rate, right? So you can put in a number, and if it pleases the client to show, gee, this trust, even though you have a 5% payout, has a 6% growth rate, look, look how nice you are. Uh, look how much money is going to the charity, close to $1.1 million, right? And you're getting this massive charitable write-off. I mean, you can paint this, you know, nice, nice imagery of this person being a real person in the community um, because you're, you're giving them an upfront charitable deduction, they're getting this annuity stream back, and at the end of the day, the charity is going to get you know, instead of using a 6%, I could have played around and put a 10% growth rate and said, gee, you're a real alpha male. Look how well you're doing on behalf of the American Red Cross. So I'm not sure, Dale, if I answered your question. Well, so if that upfront front chart on the back, put it What, like, is that on here somewhere? Yeah, actually? no, no, that's the remainder. Oh, so that's the, you actually get that $600,000? Yes, you get that six hundred. dollars Okay. Yes. And we're going to understand the charitable remainder is just is your charitable deduction. Okay. Under code section 170. CJ, you got that? And that's a one time. The, the one time. So do it up front. Got it. Game over. Okay. Then I just did some computations with a CRUD. And you could, I mean, you know. Without getting into the politics of this, you can see, guys, right, that technology can really destroy jobs. It can create jobs, right? Someone had to come up and do the, uh, create the software package, everyone agree? And they got a job and maybe they had three technicians, but the software itself, how many billable hours were lost? Because now instead of taking maybe an hour or two to really get a good computation and cross your check and have your colleague cross check, see if you come up with the same number, within two minutes, everyone in this room can get the right number, right? So poof, all that billable time disappeared, right? What was that, Joe? Yeah. Okay. So again, the software, Gives you a nice little chart, says make sure you get these things in the document. And then what I did was I just replicated what I did with the CRAD, which is with the CRUD, I did a term interest and I also did a life interest, right? Same thing. Term interest for 10 years, a um, little bit growth, smaller growth rate, but, but none of that matters. Uh, it reflected 
still, you, you're still going to get here in this case not a six hundred and nine thousand dollar deduction. Um, you're going to get a six hundred thousand dollar deduction for attorney interest. Um, and then if you go to the life, um, you're going to get a much larger deduction. There's going to be a lot more left here. Okay. Remember, with a crust, um, it's sort of self-breaking. If it gets a great return, the unit trust amount paid out will be larger every unit grade because it's a fixed percentage. And if the trust has a very poor performance, it's going to be a smaller amount, smaller growth, and you'll get a smaller payout. But that's not true with an annuity payout, right? It's a fixed amount no matter what the investment portfolio returns, right? So there's no self-breaking there. Now, for exam purposes and for my purposes, don't turn to me out. I hope you don't. But I would be very happy for tonight if you really got down cracks and cracks. Because other, other things we talked about tonight, including clats and Clots do come up, but they don't come up. I'm going to say for every, there are 10 charitable remainder trusts, 10 to 20 compared to every charitable lead trust. Okay, I'm just giving you an idea. And you may say, well, Solid, that's only your world. Maybe you don't, you know, you don't see it the way other practitioners. Um, you're right, I might not, but I, I, and there's no statistics out there. But um, I am telling you from everything I see, everything I read, everything I've done personally, uh, every time I go to other people's lectures and the discussions, the focal point is really here, not here. And largely, these are, these are for wealthy people. These are for the ultra wealthy. Maybe my client base isn't here, it's here, truth be told. So that's just a reality. So maybe God bless you guys. I'll be dealing with these folks and uh, just remember my name. Kind of <laughs> um, right? I'm just, so for my purpose, really focus in on this because that, they will come up in your practice. You should have the working knowledge. Um, they may not come up daily. You should know this is it. Again, Trump administration or no Trump administration, this, in my opinion, this landscape is not going to change. Other things may radically change in the code. Um, I don't see this on the horizon. All right, let's continue down the path of just covering the salient parts of this chapter. Pooled income funds. Pooled income funds. Um, The way the authors say of what is a pooled income, a potential helpful way of thinking about a pooled income fund is that it is a mutual fund run by a charity in which contributors surrender the right to ever receive a return of principal. Okay? This is spelled out in Code Section 642C5, I repeat, 642C5. Essentially, you put money in with a bunch of investors, the, the principal has to inure charity, and you get the income. Some of you, many of you, I, I would imagine, you've seen these, right? Where you put in money and you get back, um, the charity guarantees you'll get a fixed rate of return. And, um, Amer I, I've seen this with the American Red Cross, Consumer Reports, all sorts of charities say put in certain monies and depending on your age will give you back X percent. The older you are, the larger the percentage. Um, on the next page, the authors point out that in Revenue Procedure 88-53, 88-53, there's a whole bunch of templates. Just like we saw before here with the, with the uh, Charter Remainder and Unity Trust and Unity Trust. 
that um, you don't have to recreate the wheel. The government has done this on your behalf. Generally, even though a pooled income fund is subject to the normal rules of subchapter J, they pay out all their income and for all intents and purposes, all their capital gains in her to, ch to charity. So pooled income funds generally, notwithstanding they're subject to subchapter J, don't pay tax. They don't pay tax because, again, all their income is distributed and the remainder interest passes to charity. And the pooled income beneficiaries generally only receive, they're gonna receive, since they can't invest in tax exempt income, generally um, pooled income fund beneficiaries just receive taxable amounts. This is reflected in footnote 38. Generally, it's all tax. Okay. Now, charitable lead trust, guys. How do you think these are all distributed? Well, charitable remainder trust, right? They're set up for a term of years or for someone's life. And what happens at the end of the term of years or a person's life? Where do the funds go? To charity. To charity. So is anyone going to fall off their chair if I tell you the converse is true with respect to lead trust, right? For a term of years or for someone's life, these are sets up a charitable lead trust for her life. These is going to live at least another hundred years, right, Lisa? She lives another hundred years. That money during her life, if it's a new annuity trust, charitable lead annuity trust, every year the charity gets X dollars, whatever that dollar amount is. And after 100 years, um, whatever the principal is, will go to Theza's great great grandchildren, right? Theza. So it leads off with the charity. And it could be for a term of years again, or for someone's life or lives. Notice lead. The charity is leading off. Again, most clients can't afford to have a charitable lead trust because it could be many years or decades before the money inures back to their family. Agreed? So people will say the Kennedys will set up charitable lead trust. It's not for just even the wealthy, it's for the super wealthy. And have you made a taxable gift? Sure, Thesa has. To whom? Her great grandchildren. This time, the remainder interest, right, Dill? It's the remainder interest that is monies or wealth inuring to non charitable beneficiaries, right? And a gift tax return of Form 709 should be filed. Right? Charitable lead trust, exact converse of what we were looking at. In 2007, it took, I don't know why, with the charitable remainder trust, these came out many, many, many years ago. It's only 10 years ago that the government finally got around issuing um, lead trust. The, um, prototype form for the lead trust. Okay, so in yesteryear we didn't have sample trusts, but now we do. Now we do. Do not worry about the income taxation of charitable lead trusts, okay? Because they come in two flavors. They come Jenny, you'll appreciate this. They come as a grantor trust, okay? Everyone understand what a grantor trust is? We just looked at this in chapter four for the textbook to read. And if it's a grantor trust, who gets taxed, guys? 
There's a shocker, right? The grant board gets tax, right? And it's a non-grantor trust. The other rules apply, but most people, and this is why um, they want to avoid grantor trust status because you can only get a charitable deduction if it's a grantor trust. Okay, let me repeat this. You can only get a charitable deduction if it's a grantor trust, but very few people really want to pay the tax um, during the term of years or during the life, right? Remember, if you set this up for the American Red Cross for the next 10 years or for thesis life, do you want to be stuck with the tax burden of this trust, right? The nature of a grant or trust, right, is that you get saddled with the tax burden, agreed? But that's the only way you get a charitable deduction. So most people do not set up a charitable lead trust, which is a grant or trust, because there could be tremendous tax burden. The only way I've seen charitable lead trust set up is in the form of a testamentary trust when someone is no longer, okay? Because then, by putting it in that form, it qualifies for the estate tax deduction equal to the actuarial value going to the charity. And the remainder interest would not qualify for the estate tax charitable deduction. But you don't have to worry about grantor, non-grantor trust because the person is dead. Say, say again, Joe? So at that point, any principal and things will just be taxed to the trust. It will be taxed to the trust. Right, but then that money is going to inert to charity, so probably there will not be much in the way of tax money come to the charitable lead trust, right? Uh, well, regular income, yes, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay? Sorry, I was thinking capital gain, mm -hmm. etc. but okay. Um, And then I just want to call your attention to the last page that, uh, of the handout. The last paragraph. It says, on the termination of the charitable lead interest, distributions to private beneficiaries become possible and perhaps even mandatory. That's to these as great grandchildren, okay? And are subject to taxation of the usual subject of J distribution rules, possibly including, don't worry about the throwback. Thus, following termination of the charitable lead interest, distributions to private beneficiaries may, may yield distribution deductions up to D and I to the trust, and cause the recipients on those distributions to be subject to tax on them up to D and I. The point on, I just want to call to your attention is once the annuity amount or unit trust amount, after a term of years, for 10 years, or after a thesis life, right? The monies keep going to the charity, the Red Cross or whatever your charity is. After that point in time, then the monies will start flowing to thesis great grandchildren, right? And then normal subchapter J rules will apply, period. That's it. There's no special four tiered system. We're just back to chapters one, two, and three of our textbook. All right. So let me summarize, in my opinion, where we're at. Chapter eleven of the handout gives you a very broad framework. I'm not expecting anyone here, by the way, even after we go through the problems tonight to be masters at this. I just want you to have a working framework and you get in general how these things operate. Um, if I've done that and you retain that in the weeks, months, and years to come, I will consider tonight uh, a well worthwhile venture. So again, charitable remainder annuity trust, uni trust, know the salient features of each. We'll see this when we go through these you know, the questions. Um, pooled income funds don't come up regularly in your practice because, again, probably the big law firms or the big accounting firms handle them. 
they, these will come up in your practice. Charitable lead, annuity trust, annuity trust. You should be familiar. Clients will say, oh, I've read this on the internet. What do you think? And you probably want to dissuade them, I think. But you shouldn't look at them like a deer in headlights and say, gee, maybe I'll go on the internet after you tell me about these. You know, that's not a way to win over a client's affection. Um, and I do want to, again, emphasize that you should not be doing these computations manually. No one wants to pay you for them. And no offense to you or to me, you may not get them right. The software makes your life easy. Get the numerical outcome. If you want, buy two software packages. Make sure each one comes up with the same number. That might be well worth uh, while expenditure. Make sure if you're not the draft person, and you probably shouldn't be drafting this, the attorney should. Don't just assume the attorney, he or she, knows what he or she is doing. Um, once they draft it, cross-check it and make sure whatever form they're using is the IRS appropriate updated form. Uh, because once you sign off on it, guess what? If something's wrong and your name is on it and you built time to, you know, they wanted your client wanted you to review it, and for some reason the attorney's using uh, an outdated form, guess who's going to get blamed? So don't want to be there. All right, so why don't we take our usual break, and then when we come back, let's let's go through these questions and answers. Sound like a deal? Sound like a plan?